everybody, this is Metalia, and I'm actually recording this video um, in my campus in Trinity. Um, it's an Anglican campus, so um, I just finished one of my classes earlier. Um, um, I, I take two units. I mean, one unit in this class and one unit in this class as well, last semester. Today's topic will be a bit broad but a bit interesting which i've always wanted to talk about which is concerning the philosopher greek philosopher based in athens greece called plato so i'm sure many of you have probably heard or read the works of plato or probably just um vaguely um, um heard of him i'm going to be focusing focusing on plato's idea of the forms um and on the soul so, Plato has certainly a lot to say with uh, regarding reality um, and in regards of how he perceived the world in his philosophical lens. Um, Plato was just a philosopher. He was a simple man, um, but he was a mystical. You know, he had sort of... He was sort of like, um, in a way, a successor of Socrates, the philosopher Socrates, because he had views that aligned to some spiritual basis where he believes that there are two kinds of worlds the world of certainty and the world of change the world of certainty represents the actual reality or the forms or you could say in the christian sense if you want to say that it's the world of the eternal unchanging absolute justice ruled by god or higher power and that world constitutes and dictates what is absolutely right or wrong. There's no argument in that. And the world of change is um, represents the shadows. The world of change is comprised of mass atoms, if you'd speak in a figurative sense. You know, mass atoms like people or creatures just running around but not actually... Actually, just they're they're just vague representations of what the forms actually are, and these shadows are illusory. You know, they're just illusions meant to deceive us on and hindering us what is actually good or bad. You know, they they don't really they don't really have a peculiar um, peculiar visual visualization of what is actually good and bad, because. As human beings, as the dwellers of this earth, our senses itself deceive us. As long as we're alive, as long as we're here on earth, we still don't have the capability to understand and to differentiate what is good and bad whole. So yeah, it's, it's like a representation of a beautiful person, you know, what it is, what is beauty. What's actually the best food in the world? You know, what's the what's really a a very enthralling experience that you've ever had? Um, and music as well. Everything that is subject to time and space, you cannot grasp because it is part of that illusory, fleeting, ever fleeting wor world. It's you can't exactly capture it in that sense. And when it comes to even if even if even even though Plato regard us human externalities, I mean to say like our physicality indeed is subject to time, we will and cannot avoid decomposition, decomposition or deterioration. But our spirit Plato perceives that our spirit is eternal, and it is unchanging. It is unchanging because Plato, who strongly believes in the mystical concept of reincarnation, believes that our soul, one, once our body has decomposed, our spirit returns to God. It returns to the world of the unchanging, which is the world of the forms. So, in a sense, our body is a temporal vessel, which doesn't 
represent the true essence of who we are. So these are just my notes that I took from my class, actually from the Catholic campus, because um, I just learned about Plato um, a week ago in regards to theological anthropology or how it relates to the human person. So there are two interpretations. Um, there, there are two theories of the soul that Plato laid out. The first is the soul and the body, the structure of the soul being comprised, being divided into the soul and the body. That is the first theory. So this first theory proposes that um, the soul um, is simple, uncomposed, essentially eternal and immortal, not capable to injury. But of course, I mean like the body is still within the soul. I mean, the, the body is still like the um, part of the composite where the soul resides in. But the body is not affected at all by the soul because the soul is eternal and so does the spirit. But the body is like a whole different thing compared to the immaterial soul. They're both separate in this first theory. And the second theory proposes that the soul is comprised into three parts. Tripartite, as you would say. Three elements. First is the reason, or the mind, or the nous. The nous is a Greek word for the mind. Which is purely, purely immaterial and the spiritual. So that is like the top of the hierarchy. And the second is the spirited, or the heart. So the heart responds to fight or flight situations. It is the part where you and your emotions get aroused when you're ready for battle, on when you are, or when you are um, excited about something, or when you are fearful about something. So that is actually the central part of the soul, according to Plato. And number three is the concupiscible soul or the, the part of the soul which seeks pleasure. So that is sort of like an equivalent to the lower drives of the human body. Sexual desire, food, comfort. But as if, if you watch um, my video on the concupiscence, you'll see that, you'll understand that the word concupiscence itself actually has a sexual connotation. So it deals mainly with sexual activity. But in this case, Plato is referring to both sexual desire and the desire to consume food and the desire for comfort when we're tired. And that desire is mainly, mainly um, as I've said before in my video as well, um, it's mainly centered around the belly or the genitals. Um, so these emotions, when they are imbalanced, you know, when we have a balanced outlook of the soul and how we would, um, um, how we would actually balance these three types of souls, I mean, sorry, these three elements within the soul, it, it achieves some sort of ambivalence. Um, so it, it's like a balance of the spirit and the body because in order for us, and according to Plato, in order for us to um, to attain a virtuous or a good life, because Plato is well known for his theory on a good life, it it seeks the control of emotions via reason, and reason in here refers mainly to the mind or to news, and not be enslaved to the passions. So passions usually um, derives also from not just emotions, not just the heart, but also from the lower drive, the concupiscible senses. So I think this is a very good analogy. Um, in other words, Plato is also saying that we are the charioteer of 
the chariot. You know, we we were the driver of that chariot, but the chariot um, tumbles around in a way. In depending on how well we actually control, um, and depending how well we control the ride and our ability as a charioteer to move the chariot about. So the mind is the charioteer. The mind of the human person is the charioteer. And the body of the human person is the chariot. So the chariot resembles the spirit, which you could uh, you could imagine, you know, visualize it as the horse. And the chariot can also represent the desire, the concupiscence desire as well. There are two horses here. So this is represented into two types of horses. It is the spirit, the horse, and the other is the desire, the horse of the desire. So those two horses are, you would say, the drives of our good and bad actions as human persons. Because, of course, throughout our lives, we have to deal with this battle where, where one of our horses or one of our desires wanted to... Um, wanted to was it gallop this way and the other wants to gallop the other way so the job of the charioteer is to keep those two horses or the two desires in control so yes that basically sums up my understanding of the human person and well based on my teacher's lecture notes that i've written down as well which i find really really insightful um so let me know what you think Peace out.